Welcome to Red Solitary Series. My name is James Lucarelli and you've tuned in to the seventh installment. I want to thank everyone for tuning in and today we're going to go ahead and learn how we can go ahead and pull some stills from our motion clips. Now before we get into it, I do have a DSMC2 or digital still motion camera to my right and I'm also pointing into a DSMC2 Gemini that's shooting me live. If if anyone's ever worked with these cameras before, just know that we are able to shoot high quality motion, digital raw motion, and also pull stills as well. Notice that I can hit record on my camera right here. I can see that it's recording there live behind me. And if I be quiet for a quick second, I can actually flag stills every single time as I'm shooting those frames. Now I don't even have to make the camera go clickety click because essentially every single one of those marks or every single one of those frames can be a raw R3D still a JPEG, TIFF, PSD, PNG, or whatever file format you want. So without further ado, we do try to keep these sessions right around 30 minutes or less. So I'm gonna go ahead and navigate right to my desktop and jump right into it. Now, right off the bat, you should see the current red page and a little shout out to our Red Solitary series that we're watching now, uh, a little close to my heart here. And if you actually click this watch now, you can go back and see any of the previous six sessions in case you did want to drill down and learn a little bit more. But like I said, today we're going to be focusing on pulling stills from motion. And really, this is a very great tool. Why? Because sometimes, you know, in the, in the ever-changing world we are today, I have my cinematographers getting asked to be pulled stills for the marketing or editorial department. And I'm having my stills photographers get asked to shoot motion for their social media needs or other things like that. So what we can do with our DSMC2 cameras or our Ranger cameras is essentially shoot motion and still have that high quality still deliverable. Now I'm starting off with this resolution chart and it's this great chart to show because it shows the motion equivalent or 8K, 6K, 5K, 4K or 8192 times 4320 or 6K, 6144 by 3240 or 4K, 4096 by 2160. Now really that's just saying the lines of resolution but notice I have the still equivalent right here in the megapixels and I also have the print uh, parameters right here if you did want to see what each one of those could print at at 150 dpi now a key thing that I'll point out here is unlike some things you can't quite take 4k or 8 megapixels and add a 2k shot 2 megapixels and equal 6k 19 megapixels notice that it is length times width and every time we go from 4k to 6k or from 6k to 8k we're pretty much doubling our resolution right 4k is right around 8 megapixels 6K is right around 19 megapixels, and 8K is just, uh, just over 35 megapixels. So we're now starting to get into that high, high end print deliverable where we need to be uh, that high, high resolution. Now, it's not just having that high resolution, it's also being able to say, well, is it actually practical to work with? And that's where I lean back on the three R's. This is a great, great slide to show you here because a lot of customers and a lot of shooters want to shoot uncompressed. And notice that this slide will show you both the data rates for motion as well as for a single still. Now, uncompressed 8K will fill up that half a terabyte card in less than two minutes. 
I don't know anyone that wants to be changing out their media every two minutes. And for you still shooters, does this file size look familiar? Every time you hit click on your raw camera, right around 200, maybe 300 megabytes per second, yeah, that, that should sound familiar and really think of it this way. Every four or five clicks, we're shooting close to a gigabyte. And if you think of that throughout the whole course of your day, yeah, we might be shooting terabytes. So really uncompressed raw might not be the way to go. And that's why with red code, we can essentially shoot five to one, which is our uh, highest, highest quality that you can shoot with motion. And if we were shooting a shot like this, and maybe there's some uh, aliens that are gonna come in and start attacking this cowboy, and I need to repaint a, a little wrist rocket on his arm so he can fight off the aliens, by all means, shoot it at five to one, and look at our single frame size. We went from 200 megabytes to 12 megabytes by compressing that with a red's visually lossless wavelet compression from uncompressed to five to one, look at our single file size. 12 megabytes rather than 200 megabytes. Now, don't worry, we're not, we'll are not. we show you some examples because I know when you see that much of your file size change, you might think your quality is going down, but that's not the case with RED. And there's no better way to see that than if we did want to maybe shoot right around that Netflix sweet spot of 8K 8 to 1. And notice that at 8 to 1, we've now brought that single raw file down to 8 megabytes. I don't know about you still shooters, but me being able to tr send over a completely raw, multiple raw stills on an email is quite quite impactful and it could be time savings as well. Now, if you can't, all that file size and efficiency doesn't mean anything if it doesn't have the quality and that's why RED is shooting 16-bit raw. So it's not just raw, it's 16-bit raw compared to the 8-bit, 10-bit, 12-bit that you might get out of any one of your other cameras here. We're shooting 16-bit RAW, which is on par with some of your high-end stills cameras, and really, we're doing it at a file size that's much, much more manageable. Now, if you're still concerned about file size, I did want to show you this one last slide, and what you can clearly see is that 6K or 19 megapixel, uh, 19 megapixel resolution shooting 24 frames per second, or any of our 8K cameras shooting 35 megapixels all the way up to 60 frames per second and notice our data rates 200 100 just over 100 while all those other cameras and maybe some of them are doing uncompressed raw notice that they're 200 300 500 megabytes per second and that's where I'll also point out maybe they're doing 4k or 12 bit or 8 bit 10 bit we're doing 16 bit raw quite quite impressive and we want to go ahead and jump right into it so before i go over here into red cinex i did want to show you that if anyone did want to participate at home you can navigate right back here to red.com there are the sample r3ds right here and you could download red cinex from right here that would allow you to essentially participate and pull some stills uh, with us so without further ado let's go ahead and look at red cinex and right off the bat, you're seeing a couple of 8K clips that look familiar. They were used in that source reel. And this is my Panther Chameleon Aussie. And if you've ever shot an animal or anything like this, you know that it's really hard to get their eyes or their look going in the right direction. And this is pretty easy because I already created the whole motion clip. And really what I'm doing is just, you know what, I like it when he looks right down the pipe at me. And I'm going to go ahead and hit this little camera button right here. And that's the still snapshot button. So if I go ahead and hit the snapshot button, that's going to take one JPEG and it's going to export it to my predetermined folder. I could also hit this R3D button and that takes one raw R3D or one single raw frame and sends it to that same folder that I've already predetermined. Now let's go ahead and take a quick look at what that did right off the bat and you can see that here's my JPEG, 14 megabytes, right? I can maybe fit one, maybe two of those on an email, but I can quickly get that over to my client. And then here's the R3D or the completely 16-bit RAW file with all of that metadata and notice that it's just under 5 megabytes whereas the JPEG is close to 15. About three times the size for a flattened file when the RAW file is one-third the size. I think we'd rather work with the RAW. Now notice I've got Photoshop open right here and I could come right back to that folder and just take that completely RAW R3D file drag it right here into Photoshop, and what you're gonna see here is a nice little Red Cinex plugin. It's kind of like your Photo Raw import screen, and we'll give that a quick second here. And notice this. This looks familiar. It's very much like Red Cinex. I have all of the command history right here. I can see anything that I did with the file. I can see all of the metadata, the resolution, red code, information that I that's saved to the file. I can met, I can edit all of the raw parameters, right? I could take it from 1280 
down to 640 and bring it down a stop, take it down to 320 and now that's down two stops. And really I didn't like it quite that dark. So let's bring it back to that 640 and maybe I'll do a quick white balance off of his back right here. And once again, I'm not trying to do a whole lot of work to this Y. The marketing department really loved the motion reel. I'm really just trying to give them some raw stills so they can go ahead and work with them and maybe create something for editorial purposes. Now, if I go ahead and click OK, look what happens here. It's going to go ahead and bring it directly into Photoshop with all of the, all of the, the tools and the, and the tips and the tricks that we've, we've known and grown to love with Photoshop. And we'll give it a quick sec as it opens up here. Sometimes it'll give you the little pinwheel here and we'll... Uh, Give it a quick set to fully open up. And look at that. We're now in Photoshop with all the tools and all the layers like we've known and used for many times. And I can very quickly come on down here and duplicate my layer and then add a layer mask. And really, all of this stuff is the exact same. I can use my lasso tool. And really, I'm not going to go into a Photoshop demonstration. Why? There's plenty of great demonstrations out there. And really, once you've gotten to this point, it's just like working with any other file in Photoshop. So let's go ahead and close that out and go right on back to Red Cine X. And I showed you, this was the snapshot button, this is the raw snapshot button, but really we can actually maximize this so we're not just going clickety-click and, and coming through individual frames. If I wanna come over here to my preferences and change my snapshot from JPEG, this is the where I could very easily change my output format. And for all you motion shooters, think of JPEG kind of like your H.264 proxy. Think of your TIFF as your 422HQ. Some people like to finish in it. Others like to just use it as a, as a transfer file. And then here's your DPX or your uncompressed. Now for this exercise, I'm going to change this to TIFF. And I'm going to leave the resolution the same. And I'm not going to do any output presets. Why? Because the marketing team already said that they love the look. And I'm really just trying to give them some stills that can match the motion file that we already provided. Now I really like this frame right here. And I just hit M on my keyboard and that marked it. Or you can hit this little flag right here and it does the same thing. And then maybe I come forward a little frames and I like when his eye looks up and catches a little gleam of the light right there. I really like that. And then maybe I scrub forward a little bit forward and I like when he looks forward to the future and you can see his little arm moving out right there. So if you notice, I quickly just marked that with the M and if you expand your timeline right here, what you can clearly see is I've now marked three stills they're now saved into the metadata, and there's no more guesswork with, hey, what was the still? What was the frame that they were looking for? I can cl easily click on the marker. It tells me exactly the frame count where we are. And remember, if we already set up our snapshot button, I can just highlight the three stills I want, hit the snapshot button, and look what happened here. I'm now exporting three TIFFs. They're going back to that same predestined folder here. And if I navigate back to my folder here, what you can see is those TIFFs start to start to populate the folder here and notice what's happening here. The TIFFs are 200 megabytes. The JPEGs are right around 15 megabytes. And here's my raw file here, which is one third the size. So really, I know that doesn't make sense to, to, to a lot of other camera manufacturers that our raw file is actually smaller than our, uh, than some of the workable files and then definitely bigger than some of the deliverable files. So really that's the benefit of working with the RAW, but I know some of you photographers out there don't like to touch every single frame. So what I'm gonna show you here is a really great time, time saving trick. And I just showed you how you could export three via the snapshot button. But notice I've got three more clips here. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is just very quickly come in here and play the motion and I'm gonna go mark, mark, mark. And I kind of just did that pretty willy nilly. And the same thing here, hit play again, mark, mark, mark. And same thing here on the end, one here at the beginning, one here where his eye changes. And I like when his tongue comes out and he kind of gets a little taste right there. I'm gonna do one more right there. So I just marked three, three frames or four frames in this last one. And let's just delete one of these three frames in these last three clips, and I wanna export my 12 stills. Now I could go back and touch three clips, or you navigate over here into the export tab, and this is a great way to paint with a broad brush and essentially do all of those exports all at once. Now I'm gonna go ahead and clear this list so we have a nice clear export queue, and notice all my presets over here. I'm a big preset guy, why? Because if it works once, don't change the system, and really this wouldn't be a good solitary series if I just pointed to my TIFF or my stills export or my R3D or my PSD export and said, see, that's how you did it. do it. So what I'll go ahead and do is hit this little plus button and we're gonna go ahead and create a 
still export right here, a preset. So for this exercise, I'm gonna call this solitary series, TIFF, and we're gonna call this version three. Now you will wanna come down here and set up your file format, and notice there's JPEG, DPX, PSD, QuickTime, and for this exercise, I already said we're gonna do TIFF, you will have to hit this setup button and notice I'm not going to change the bit depth. I'm not going to change the color profile. I want everything to come out in the full 16 bit. And I am also not going to change the resolution here, but that's how you could very easily take it from 8K to 4K or um, make your clip slightly smaller. Now, once again, this is also where I could take it back to log, but I'm going to leave everything graded because I want to keep it in that same look and that same color space as what I previously showed to the marketing department. And I am going to do a custom output here because I want everything to go to that predetermined folder. And I want everything to go to my stills export and click OK. Now, before you go ahead and click OK, OK, there's one key step here that you have to do. You have to come over here to this frame mark, this frame tab, and then hit export markers only. If you don't hit this export markers only, it'll essentially go back and turn every single one of your frames into TIFFs, and really that's gonna be quite massive and I don't recommend that you do that. So let's go ahead and click save, and we just went ahead and created this brand new solitary series TIFF export, and check this out. I've got my four clips over here. I could very easily come over here and say export all my clips, but really we already exported the first three stills, so let's just do selected stills, selected clips, and I'm going to select just these last three right here and then click export. And look what happens right here. I'm starting to go through. It's exporting out all of those TIFFs, all of the markers from my three raw clips here. And all the while, as they're finishing, I can navigate back over here to my folder and I can see my folder starting to fill up with all of those 200 megabyte TIFFs. Now, as this starts to as this starts to populate, this is a great time to go ahead and segue over into Lightroom. And really, all I have to do in Lightroom is get back to that same folder. And I'm going to get back to that stills folder here. No files. And let's go ahead and find that stills export. And I'm not seeing that folder here. Give me one quick second here. All right. And we're just gonna go ahead and restart Lightroom here because it's not working with me. And while I'm doing that, I did wanna come back here into Red Cinex. And notice that if we come back over here to the Edit tab, I did wanna show you real quick, and you may have noticed it in the, um, in, the, in the motion clip that started this, these were all 8K files, but really I did that in 8K. Why? Because I very quickly wanted to show you guys what a 4K punch-in would look like, or a 4K extraction for my 8K file or a 6K extraction for my 8K file, and just notice that 6K is right around 19 megapixels, that 4K is right around eight megapixels, and if you saw it in the stream, we were able to essentially go full frame, and I was able to zoom into that 4K resolution, and essentially pan and do a little post zoom all the way down Ozzy's back. Really cool benefit of working with 8K, because that allowed me to do that post zoom, or maybe punch in to find that shot within my shot, and really, I didn't have to worry about losing any detail. Great benefit for using the 8K. Now let's go ahead and see if Lightroom opened back up for us. Thank you for your patience here. All right, and Lightroom opened back up for us and we'll give that a quick second here and I'm gonna look over to my left and see if anyone has any questions thus far. And it looks like my associates have been handling all these in the chat. I wanna thank everyone for uh, being patient and typing in your questions. If there was any questions that we did not answer yet, just know that you can always um, you can always email us at solitaryseries at red.com and it's a great way to get any follow-up questions in case it wasn't uh, wasn't wasn't addressed in the stream. Perfect. Well, I'm going to let Lightroom continue to open up here. And if we wanted to go ahead and look at the TIFFs that we did, we did go ahead and export, notice that I could go ahead and click on one of these TIFFs. These are 200 megabyte files that came from my original 5 megabyte file. And that's pretty impressive because if I wanted to zoom in here, 
you're going to see detail on this critter's back that you never really saw when we were looking at it at the wide. Really quite impressive here. I can see which scales have broken off and which scales are starting to grow in. And this is some really cool texture here that I just would not quite have if we were working with a, a lower resolution camera or maybe doing a video frame grab, which is definitely not what we're doing here. All right, Lightroom's woken back up. And let's just go file and import. Come on, work with me. All right, we've now got to the, our import screen and we're gonna go to that same stills export folder and look at that. All of the TIFFs minus the video files are ready to go ahead and import and I'm gonna go ahead and just hit the import button and look what we did here. We just imported those high quality TIFFs directly into our photo editing program. We'll give it a second here to populate. I'm a little bit more of a Photoshop guy, but really Lightroom is really great because essentially I can come to the develop tab. I can look at my very first TIFF here. And I like to be in Lightroom and work with my presets. It's very nice for me to look at my very first image here, maybe add a vivid preset, maybe some light sharpening to bring out those scales on his back. And you know, he's kind of center, center framed and I want everyone to focus right here on him. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a little medium vignette. And if you did wanna see a little side by side of what we did here, here's the original TIFF. Here's the one that we have added a couple of effects to. I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this, copy all of the parameters. And now it's very easy for me to come down here on my develop tab. I can see all of the previous, uh, uh, as I start to go through my clips here, and as I start to go through my next clip here, I can just paste, paste, paste. And the nice thing is, is we are essentially not having to reinvent the wheel. We are just, we are just essentially, and I'm not seeing my other TIFFs there. So that's a great way that we, oh, there we go. And if I come back over here to the develop tab, if I did want to go ahead and export this one, uh, you can clearly come right back over here and see the little plus minus. That is the one that we did go ahead and affect. And let's go ahead and export this. Now notice as I'm exporting from Lightroom, we're gonna get one more, one more chance to essentially export the file, change it to a different file format. I can come down here and go from TIFF to JPEG or to PSD or PNG. I can also change the bit depth. And really, I'm not gonna add any watermarks or anything like that. And let's go ahead and export that one frame. So that's exporting as a, as a TIFF with my uh, Lightroom effects on here. And really, if I come back out here to my final Lightroom export, what we can actually see is here's that brand new file that we just uh, added our pre-canned effects in Lightroom. And now we can see that there is the fully finished still. I can zoom in on it and see all of that same scale, scale de detail. And really, this has the nice print effect on it. And this is right ready to go over to editorial with multiple multiple frames that all have that great look. Pretty cool stuff. Now I did wanna take this time to go ahead and move myself into upper left-hand corner. And I wanted to thank everyone for being so patient as I went ahead and navigated and pulled some stills. Now I do wanna take this time to uh, queue up. We have a great red tech from our in-house photo editor and content creator in Clay Reed. And I'm gonna go ahead and play that for you now. Hey everyone, Clay from Red here to talk DSMC2, more specifically digital stills for motion. Today I'm going to be demoing one of my favorite techniques that takes one motion clip, uses a frame or two from within that motion clip, and makes a better still. At over 35 megapixels and up to 60 frames per second, 8K makes it easy to catch every moment. But even when you have perfect focus and a sharp shutter, sometimes a moment just doesn't quite work out. So pick the frames you want. Pull R3D snapshots, open those frames in Photoshop, use the pen tool to select the portions of the frame that you want to use, combine those pieces, I merge up a new layer, pull everything together with a little sharpening with a high pass filter, add some grading elements, maybe a little vignette, I like curves, levels, and hue saturation, really simple stuff. Alright, I like that. Let's export a version for the web. Pretty simple, right? Okay, you try. <laughs> Thanks for watching. All right, without further ado, let's welcome in Clay Reed, our in-house filmmaker, photo editor. Clay, how you doing this morning? Hey, everybody, how's it going? I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, it's a great lesson so far. I've been watching along. 
Well, thank you everyone for tuning in. And I know we've got a bunch of questions and I did see one come in on the chat about if we are going to do some in-camera stuff. We will do that right after the Q&A. So I wanted to thank everyone for chatting in your questions. And this would be a great time to feed them over to us and we'll get them up to Clay. Now, if I look over to my left, uh, first one comes right over and it's, Clay, what is your go-to setup if you are going to go out and shoot both motion and stills? Yeah, so I kind of demoed in uh, my last little red tech guy, but this is what I call my daily driver. And so basically it's got a ton of stuff on it. It's got focus control built into a thumb wheel over here. Uh, and really what this rig does is it allows me to get great shots on the fly, handheld, which is often how I'm shooting a lot of my combo stuff, right? So uh, a good amount of what I do is shoot sort of a sweet spot where I'm capturing motion clips that will work as stills. And so that I find that a handheld rig like that is is great for that as long as you have some practice handholding. <laughs> and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's the same camera that you're kitting up to shoot stills, but I've also seen you de-kit that and put that into a gimbal or maybe put two or three people on set. So it is that flexible option where you can go to your day driver and then back to your on-set sticks configuration completely and also that's not the only rig i shoot stills on right that's kind of my all around hitting both things i mentioned earlier in the chat that my other rig that i use for more still specific when i'm not splitting the two is actually my dsmc2 side handle with the gdu hand uh stock on the bottom of it mm -hmm. and i use that for a much lighter setup which is a bolt-on monitor a simple power port on the back and my side handle and that gets me tons of great stills so mm -hmm. you can Build it up, tear it down. It can kind of fit in whatever workflow you're working on. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the largest print still deliverable you've ever been able to to provide off of a motion clip? That's awesome. We've done huge stuff. We've done trade show banners. We've done whole walls. And also, one of the big things that I've seen recently is people are doing big billboards. I mean, if you look at some pretty big names that had billboards up there, i.e. Mindhunter, mm -hmm. they're actually R3D poles. So what that means is that they had the opportunity to shoot regular stills, but instead they chose frames from the production mm -hmm. to incorporate into those billboards, which is really cool in my opinion. And it shows that it is actually pretty simple to take your R3Ds and make your movie poster out of your content that's in the film. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you wouldn't think it makes much of a difference, but if we bring both a still photographer and a motion photographer, and you're looking here and I'm looking here, we have to do two shots or double our time on set, or we pull stills from that motion and we'll have that same look and that same direct shot that we were going for. Completely, and I, I've been on a bunch of sets where we're doing both, and I've even been on sets where um, I'm doing one or the other, and I like the other person, but it's tough not to get frustrated when you're fighting over talent. <laughs> Move. You know? yeah. Look over here. No, look over here. Yep. Uh, well, great. Exactly. Yeah, no, definitely great. And, and I see a question coming in. If you're marking frames when shooting, can you see those markers in Red Cine X? Great question. It, great question, and actually we're going to cover that right after the Q&A, so we don't yep. even have to answer it verbally. I'll show you <laughs> exactly. it here in just a second. So I'm seeing a question actually about using HDRX to get sharper stills. I think that is a great option. If mm -hmm. you have enough space, shooting an A and an X track that are separated significantly by their shutter speed mm -hmm. means that you could use that motion clip from the first and pull a still from the second. The main thing to think about is that you're going to want to really carefully navigate your exposure settings in that condition right so it's really tough to expose for a three to six stop split so meaning that your x track and your a track are going to be pretty vastly different light exposures depending on how much stoppage you separate them and, uh, and that's really creative too right you're not just doing the hangar door shot where you're walking in and then going outside you're essentially using it to either have the the smeary shutter and have that tack sharp shutter at the same time pretty ground yep. Pretty, pretty impressive stuff. And, and I did see a question come in that was asking about your focus thumb wheel. Are you using uh, the one on the side handle? Yeah, so I've got an older one, mm -hmm. uh, but I've got, I've got RT motion. So okay. it, it's the same in the Teradek line now. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I got it back when it was RT motion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great question on, you know, when we're talking to cinematographers, we're more concerned with angles. When we're talking to photographers, we're more concerned with integration time. Is there a go-to for yourself that you like to shoot where you can maybe get a little bit of both? Yeah, so I mean, if I'm if I'm shooting for 
a, a shot that I want to use the motion clip and the still from it, mm -hmm. I often lean towards a little bit higher frame rate. And one of the reasons behind that, and I noticed this kind of coming up in the chat, one of the reasons behind that is that you want to negotiate a higher shutter speed to freeze good stills, right? And anytime you're pushing that shutter speed higher, mm -hmm. it could be at the expense of your motion clip, meaning that mm -hmm. you're not going to get motion blur, which is a pretty natural thing to see in films. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of uh, cinematographers who shoot action and things like that will actually crank to a 144 degree shutter when shooting slightly higher frame rates. The rationale behind this is that a faster shutter means that a, a little bit less motion blur. And because you're seeing each moment on frame for a little bit longer, it's actually visually more appealing to see a little bit less motion blur on those slower moving frames. Mm -hmm. And so with a 144 degree shutter, when you get up into the 60 frames per second, 96 frames per second range, then you're really starting to freeze motion pretty, pretty tack specifically. And, and if you notice in the skate clip that I pulled, there are some points. This is a great example of me splitting the difference. So there's, uh, if you look really closely, a little bit of his hand is starting to blur because that movement was a little bit faster than my shutter speed was able to cover. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that that is a is sort of a good middle area. And on that one, I'm shooting 60 frames per second out of 144 degree shutter. So mm -hmm. I think that's a way you could negotiate a balance between the two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, 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 and those are great suggestions, right? Find that middle ground where you get good motion and good stills. And by shooting a higher frame rate, your 180 degree shutter or that 144 is now that much faster based off of your frame rate. Um, right. Gotta... Someone actually commented in and said HDRX with high frame rate. And I would say no. <laughs> I would say that that's going to take up a whole lot of data, right? So you're essentially better off or better served doing one or the other. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, HDRX is going to shoot twice as many frames, right? So you're essentially shooting 48 mm -hmm. and you're getting a huge different on difference on your shutter speed mm -hmm. between those two. Mm -hmm. So that's a good example of wanting to shoot maybe 24 at 48, but then wanting to pull a still from it later, as long as you can negotiate the stoppage difference mm -hmm. um, versus shooting for both effectively at the same time, mm -hmm. you might want to shoot 60 frames per second, which will be a little bit higher data. Mm -hmm but it'll offer you a single clip that does both. Mm -hmm. So without that stop difference. Mm -hmm. I got a good question here and it's, 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 it's a question asking if there's m any gamma curves or any corrections that you do in IPP2 before you go into your Lightroom, your photo finishing program. Are you, are you doing much grading there or is it for yourself? I'm, I'm honestly not, I'm, I'm pretty much sticking to what Graham has set up because mm -hmm. he, a genius <laughs> and, and so i i really like the way that ipp2 works for mm -hmm. me personally mm -hmm. i i tend to stick pretty close to what our standard is which is medium and soft mm -hmm. there are conditions where i'm shooting a lot of outdoor action and that usually happens in the middle of the day where the light isn't very good and my stop difference is pretty high mm -hmm. so with those, I might go for very soft mm -hmm. um, and, and, and let that roll off, uh, help the clouds and things like that stay in frame a little bit better. But I, I do think that, that the reality is that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tuned pretty well by mm -hmm. some pretty amazing people, and I just don't think I'm better at it than them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good, great, great, great answer there. And I've got a question coming in here from one of the one of the photographers here. Is there? I, I know you shoot on your still camera and you shoot on your motion camera, but are there any still jobs that you do now solely on your motion camera for for a specific reason? I think one of the big things that is positive for people and um, could be really really eye opening and maybe surprising for some people. Um, it's product photography. <laughs> and so I do all of our product photography. Well, I should have been that. I, I used to do every single one of our product images. Now I do more of the advertising images and a little bit less of the tabletop photography. Mm -hmm. um, but with that said, uh, all of the photography is shot on red. And I just, I, I've been doing some stuff with motion control rigs for the motion clips, but shooting them as really slow moving time lapses. Mm -hmm. and uh, and using a sharper shutter within that time lapse to take stills out of that so it gives me a really smooth motion control mm -hmm. shot mm -hmm. because i'm moving so slowly the motors don't tend to jerk around as much mm -hmm. um, and it also allows me to pull great stills from any moment within that so it took what would have been two separate shots and i'm getting them out of one shot so mm -hmm. that's that's something 
that I think is, is a huge step up. I came originally from shooting um, on Hasselblad product photography when I came to the company. Mm -hmm. And so at first we only had 5K mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, oh goodness. And you know, I'm kind of working with that. And I found some techniques that were able to get, yield great images. Mm -hmm. And since then we've been bumping up in resolution. And every time I'm like, Ooh, that made my job easier. Oh, great. Everything looks better because mm -hmm. product photography is a really precise and minute type of thing to shoot. And so you're diving in really far a lot of the time and, and want things to be incredibly clean and crisp. And so there's also some stuff like frame blending, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something that is really amazing in our camera that helps your product photography. If you want to eliminate noise and things like that, you can do frame blending. There's just a lot of things in the product realm that are benefited from our camera system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and when you are doing product photography, I know there's a lot of core you know, principles and things that stay the same, but is there any equipment challenges or things that you just need to be concerned of when you are doing product photography, things like that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest equipment differences when you're used to a photography workflow and you're moving over to a motion and photography workflow mm -hmm. is lighting, mm -hmm. right? So strobes. So it's it's tough. Uh, it's it's really tough because there's certain things strobes can do that are next to impossible for constant lights to do, but mm -hmm. those scenarios are so specific right so um in midday you're shooting a building for architecture and you want to light the shadow side of the building it is going to take you a whole lot of rigging and lighting and crew to get that happen in a constant light mm -hmm. where you could take a couple of high power flashes and fill that in mm -hmm. that that's something that is going to be a general limitation however Mm -hmm. What I would say is that I came from shooting strobes to shooting constant lights, and I found it to be much, much easier, especially in setup. Mm -hmm. So one thing is your modeling light on strobes never really looks like the strobe, mm -hmm. right? But when I flip on a constant light, it's showing me all the lighting that I'm actually going to use in my scene in a way that my eyes are a little bit more apt to understand. Mm -hmm. That's one part. The other part is that I've just noticed a, a little bit more speed from that and also Ivan was talking about earlier rolling long clips right and then finding the frames you like in that or marking those frames as you go mm -hmm. and that's something with a strobe that if you're finding the angle and you're like oh that's perfect and then you fire you're probably losing that moment right but with constant lights and shooting a, a motion clip every single moment you see that you like is in your footage so I just think that there's you know some drawbacks to someone who's used to a strobes workflow moving into constant lights. Mm -hmm. But I also think that there's a huge amount of benefits you get. I got two more questions for you. You know, technique apart, does the thought of you shooting stills change the way you shoot or compose your video? In other words, does this change your creativity or does this expand it? Uh, that's such a cool question. I actually really like that question. So for me, there maybe are some considerations. I think that maybe the consideration is more in which frame you choose. I think one thing to think about is that uh, a still has to tell a story in a single frame, mm -hmm. whereas a shot can use movement and change within the shot to express some of its um, intention. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I focus on is that a single image has to have great framing and its composition should tell some sort of story. Whereas a moving shot can start on one type of composition and end on a different type of composition. And so I think that there's just a little bit of slight change in creativity when you're thinking about the different ones. Mm -hmm. But I think popping back into product photography, mm -hmm. when I do those motion control setups, um, one of the things I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, the, the first frame and the last frame are good beginning and ending points, but somewhere in the middle is actually the best still or the still that I enjoy the most. And so that's why I, I crank up that shutter speed. And I think somebody asked me um, what the, the amount of frames I'm capturing uh, maybe not. I know for uh, myself, you and I talked about shooting 60 because at 60 yeah. frames per second, there's not a DSLR medium format still camera that can shoot that fast and then also have that high of high of resolution and then also be 16 bit raw. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm and that's like that's one of those things where I play with that a lot more in the splitting the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so I think that's like, that's, that's where DSMC2 kind of starts to shine above everything else in the sense that you're getting uh, two jobs done at once, <laughs> which is just not possible on the other cameras. Or keeping the budget down by not having to bring two people on set or for the individual owner operator, doubling up your income stream. So it, it, it's definitely something that we can expand our creativity. And I, totally. and I thank you for whoever asked that great, great question. I got one more tough one for you here. Yep. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? Oh man, favorite ice cream flavor. I'm I'm the worst. Everybody's gonna laugh at me. Vanilla. <laughs> I like keep it simple. I like I, I do prefer a nice actual vanilla bean one. Okay, that, that was my follow up. Not the too. not the yellow thrifty <laughs> vanilla. You like the bougie no, white no, vanilla I, with the little bits of crunchy black in there. Okay, I a guess. little bit. I I I would lean that way. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and, and close the Q&A portion because I did want to show some in-camera stuff. And then Clay's also going to be monitoring your questions. I'm going to go ahead and move ourselves to top left. Thank you so much, Clay. See you later, guys. <laughs> Perfect. And as I move ourselves to top left, I did see one question come in about uh, exporting your TIFFs and your color space when you're bringing that into Lightroom. And I did want to show you just one more thing on the export tab. So if I'm coming back to my export tab here and Red Cinex. And if you want to, let's just work on the preset that we created right here. I'm just gonna highlight it and edit it. And essentially, someone was asking, what about BT1886, bringing it into Lightroom? Well, notice here's all of your other options, right? You can change your gamma space. You can change your color space. Uh, there's your Adobe 1998 there. Once again, I wanted to keep everything within the same Rec 709 BT 1886 that matched the, 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 the motion clip that was starting at the beginning of the stream. So that's why I kept it the same. But notice you can change your color space or your gamma space. I would do that right here. Why? Because this is still raw. You can make that change. And this would be before you export out to your Lightroom program. So I hope that answered your question. And if you give me one quick sec here, I'm just going to go ahead and make sure that my menus are uh, quite right here. And we're going to go to my camera menu here in full. And what you should see is myself in the upper left hand corner right here. And you should be looking at live. And yep, I, it looks like Ozzy moved midstream. So let me go ahead and just pan the camera down. And, uh, oh, of course, Ozzy's hiding down at the bottom of this cage. Well, the good news is I'm going to turn my head slightly here and just move my cursor over. And let's go in and focus in on that little bit of detail over here by his tail. And what we're shooting is 8K at 5 to 1, essentially the lowest, lowest red code you can shoot. But even now at 5 to 1, that's still only 260 megabytes per second. Now watch as I go ahead and hit record on my side handle. You're going to see that little yellow tally come up because I have him in pre-record. And now I can essentially, I know there's not a whole lot of movement right now, but I don't even have to make it go clickety click. But when I make it go click, I'm adding those same little markers that we did in post. So really, do you rather, would you rather shoot your shot and make it go click, click, click? Or would you rather go into post and, and go two frames forward or go two frames back? There's no penalty and you can do it at any point. And if you don't like that trigger sound, we can turn it off or change it. Now, what I just showed you was a great way how you could shoot motion and then also flag stills. Now, what if we're doing product photography? What if I essentially only want to make one frame go with one record? And really what I'm going to show you here is a little pro tip called the zero frame burst. And we're going to give up on continuous motion. So you notice I have audio right now and we're also shooting motion. But watch this. I'm going to go ahead and turn my head. I'm going to go menu settings, recording, and notice that if I come down here to the mode, there's a bunch of various modes that the DSMC2 and the Rangers can record in. We're not gonna have time to go through all of them. Today we're gonna focus on red code burst, and this is a really, really great way to essentially uh, not shoot motion, but get the lowest, lowest compression that you can and only get stills. Now I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna do a zero frame burst, and it's gonna make sense in just a second, hang with me, and I'm gonna do zero frames on my post count. So essentially, every single time I start a clip, it's not going to record any frames, but it's going to start a whole new clip where I can flag a bunch of stills. Watch this. I now essentially am going to come in here, and let's pretend I'm doing my best Clark Dunbar, and we're shooting a lot of chameleons today. Or maybe we're shooting a lot of different clothes or dresses today. Or maybe we're shooting a lot of different skin tones, whatever it is. And what I can essentially do is start the clip. Right now we're on clip 34, and essentially clip 34 has started, and I need to get 10 stills of his tail. And then I need to go to a wide, because the marketing wants a wide with the product stuff in there. And I get 10 more with the product. 
and I need to zoom back in and they wanted me to get artsy and I'm gonna do a rack and so somewhere in that rack you're gonna get him being in focus now I just did that very quickly but look what I just did there I just flagged 30 raw stills at red code of 2 to 1 which you can't do in traditional motion now if I go ahead and end that clip, and my hands are going to represent a new chameleon because I only have one chameleon, but essentially change, change, I now brought in the new chameleon and I've started a new clip, clip 36. And I can make sure I'm in focus, and then I'm going to flag 10 stills, and then I'll get my wide for the marketing team, and go back in, and I'm going to do that rack all the way through. And notice if I come back to playback, menu playback, essentially all of those stills are all within the RDC or the red digital clip. And the nice thing is here, if I want to make a change, notice that I'm going to come up here and if I hit play, it's just going to go through it really quick because it's not motion. But I could also scrub through and find just the still I want. Yep, that's the one I want, but it's a little too bright. So I'm going to take it from 1280 down to 640, that's one stop, or all the way down to 320, that's now two stops. Now notice, I didn't have to touch each still, and really, if I come back here and look at the playback, there would be individual markers. Now, let's go back two clips to one of the clips that was my motion one, and I wanted to show, because I saw the question come in of, what does it look like when you mark it when you're shooting motion and you're just hitting the mark button? And if I go back, what you should see here Yep, and you can see it right there at the top. Essentially, those little red markers are the markers that it's the same thing as me going through and post and hitting MMM and mark, mark, mark. So that is something that you could easily do. And I know what you're thinking here. Even if we go click, 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 we're going to be a tenth of a second late. But really, all you'd have to do is go back to my witness points and then go one frame forward or one frame back. It's a really great way to essentially make sure that your photo team, your editor, your retoucher, everyone's on the same page. And really that's gonna allow you to get very, very high quality stills. Let me look over to my left and see if anyone has any more questions on the in-camera portion. And I'm gonna check one more time, see if there's any more questions here coming from my live team. And it looks like they've been handling all the questions and I wanna thank everyone for tuning in. I try to keep these right around 40 minutes plus or minus. So I'm gonna go ahead and take it back to my camera in full cause I'm not, can you change the sound of the still? Great question. You can definitely change the sound of the, of the still marker. And if we wanted to see it live, I'm gonna go menu, settings. I believe it is uh, setup. Audio, I, that's where it is. It's in the audio tab, control. Is it recording? Ah, there it is. All right, guys, if, uh, sorry it took me a second to do it live and remember where all those menus are. And if I did wanna go back to my camera menu so you guys can see exactly where I'm at, we're in menu settings recording mode and then go over to the indicator tab. And once you're on the indicator tab, this is where I could easily turn off the sound and now there's no sound or it's the tag still frame. Right now it's shutter. We could also do this one, which is also really nice because I want my talent to think that every time we hear that, I want... Uh... So every time we're hearing the clickety click, I want you to hear all the money we're gonna be making. So just a little cool little uh, addition that we can do there. And once again, you could take off that shutter sound completely. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and take it back to my camera in full. I wanna thank everyone for tuning in. This has been a great solitary series. And on the way out, I did wanna queue up. There is our red foundations reel. It has some great shots from all of our customers. And more specifically, there's two really good um, fashion shots that are from Mark Toya, one with really low key lighting, one with high key lighting. They're both on that sample R3D page. And I would definitely encourage you all to feel free to download them, try and pull some stills on your own, share them back with us, hashtag solitary series. We love to see the interaction. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in and sending over your suggestions. And uh, this is James Lucarelli thanking you for tuning in. And you're going to see that foundations reel on the way out. Thanks so much. Uh -huh.